Okay, hey everybody, welcome to the What Is Money Show. I am thrilled and honored today to be sitting down with a very special individual, Mr. James Davidson, who is the co-author of a book that I have been repping for a long time now, The Sovereign Individual. Uh, James, it's great to have you here. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Robert. My pleasure. So we recently did uh, an appearance together on Real Vision, um, talking about this book as well. But I'm hoping to go into a few topics today that I'm in particular interested in in your book. Um, and as I was just saying to you offline, I think it's very important. You know, we're recording this March 1, 2022. The writing is on the wall, so to speak, about the dissolution of the nation state. And your book, written in 1997, or at least published in 1997, um, just had unbelievable prescience about everything we're going through today. Um, there's just a few highlights for the audience. You know, you guys basically predicted social media back in 1997. I think you called it narrow casting versus broadcasting in the book. You predicted the emergence of anonymous digital cyber cash, which today we call crypto or Bitcoin. Um, and you also, there's several other predictions in there, but another one that stood out to me was that when the nation state started to see the existential threat, uh, digital technology and encryption posed, that it would ultimately um, resort to some sort of global pandemic to try and reinforce the validity of their borders and, um, and you know, just establish control of the population. So. You know, there's three insights. There's many more packed in the book, um, but I highly encourage everyone to go out and read it. With that, me, <laughs> I'm sorry. You make me feel underpaid. Robert. <laughs> <laughs> With all that said, um, perhaps I could just wrap on a few of the themes with you here. And the first one, which I think is the big theme in the book, you guys wrote that microprocessing will subvert and destroy the nation state. And closely related to this is a very esoteric concept called the, the logic of violence or the economics of violence or the returns of violence. And it's not something, I had never heard of this before reading your books. So I don't think it's something um, very widely known. And you wrote that essentially information societies promise to dramatically reduce the returns to violence in part because they transcend locality. So maybe I could just turn it over to you to hit on the big theme there. Like clearly when you say something like that, that digital technology or encryption or microprocessing is gonna subvert and destroy the nation state, this can be a lot for someone to take in. So how do you approach this topic to explain it to, to a layman? Well, I think there are a couple of ways of approaching it, but it's an abstract concept to be sure. So you have to, the nation state ditch the 40 minute limit. Oh, what's this talking about? Anyway, I think one good way to think about it is that we have a different set of overlapping rules of different games that are being played simultaneously in life. There is the economic game whereby people try to prosper within the rules, with the rules in inverted commas because what are the rules? There is another game, the political game, in which people try to change the rules and profit. And then beyond that, there's what we call the mega political game where there are no rules except the laws of nature and the coalitions of violence that people can form. And this is seen in its most extreme form by Putin 
invading Ukraine. But it's seen all the time. The mugger in the street Im improvises new rules. He's not waiting for the Congress to give him a license to take your wallet, but he'll take it if he can get his hands on it. And you're just as far out of luck if he does that as, as if the Congress had passed the law and given it to him. And these laws of nature have are not fixed either. They are the outcome of improvisations based on some horizon in which people have the ability to use power. And that's why when gunpowder was invented, it changed the nature of society in a series of very profound ways because as William Playfair argued in the end of the 18th century, when violence or jousting or sword fights were the only way that power was exercised, it was difficult for anybody to be rich and relax at the same time. I mean, you couldn't really enjoy your new Rolls Royce if you had to stop and beat the hell out of somebody at every intersection to keep it. You know? So the scale of violence went up with gunpowder. It meant that it, even a weakling could kill a very strong person with a shot to the head or a volley of a rifle. And this made a huge difference. It meant also that the kind of defensive retreats that people could put together changed in character. And this was vividly illustrated when an army under, of Charles, King Charles of France laid siege to an Italian city-state and reduced its walls to rubble within a couple of hours when the, that same installation had resisted and fought off a siege that lasted for years, hmm. only a few years earlier before the cannon were developed and perfected. So this was a, uh, a very profound lesson, I think, a change. But not all changes make for the enlargement of power. If you need to have an army of 100,000 men to get anywhere in, change, in terms of changing the government, there are not many changes will take place. But it's also true that, as I suggested in the sovereign individual, that when you get miniaturization with the microprocessor, the microprocessor also reduces the scale at which violence can occur. Mm -hmm. And you listed a number of themes of the book, which I thought were I thought I was pretty shrewd to have thought of them when I first wrote about them, but there are others. One of them is that you, you can get down to the scale with bots and artificial intelligence where a single person could put in motion cyber warfare. We've seen that expressed in numerous ways in recent years and it's inherently incorporated into the Russian strategy as they attack Ukraine. And in fact, Scientific American has recently been expressing a lot of interest in the changes in US military posture that were brought about by watching the Russians attack Ukraine in 2014. Because in, in Russia is really sort of at the peak of the world's hacking mm -hmm. power. 
you know, they attack all kinds of things all the time. And we sometimes wonder why are they doing that? Well, part of it is a, a rehearsal for military action. Mm. They attack the Ukrainian systems and close them down. That makes it harder for them to deploy the Stinger missiles and the other little bits and pieces they have to fight off the Russian army. And the Russian army is operating on a really huge scale. It was reported by the BBC yesterday that a convoy of tanks 60 kilometers long was entering Ukraine from Russia. Wow. Now that is a lot of tanks, man. That's a traffic jam on any highway you look at. And I think it's actually almost a miracle that the Ukrainians have been able to hold out as long as they have. Mm -hmm. But we'll see. I don't think that war is ever a pleasant thing to hear about. Mm -hmm. And I think the loud barking of the dogs of war, is, if we go back to that famous metaphor, is drowning out a lot of the more subtle factors that are at work in this. And we've seen President Biden and the leaders of the UK, France, Germany, Italy, Japan, Australia, and other countries put forth a series of sanctions on Russia that include the so-called nuclear option, which is excluding the central bank of Russia from the SWIFT system. And SWIFT, for those who don't know it, is the society, the worldwide financial transaction, blah, blah, blah. It is an information system. It doesn't actually transfer money, but it informs one bank that a certain packet of money is going to be belonging to them. And when that happens, it does become the property of the, the transferee. And this leads to a uh, big efficiency over the old fashioned ways that they used to do this. And having eliminated the SWIFT system for Russia doesn't mean that the Central Bank of Russia cannot call up and say, look, we've got $50 million worth of gold here that we're prepared to ship to you in exchange for $50 million. Mm. They could still do that. They could still do it by telegraph, telephone, mm -hmm. carrier, if anybody had a way of receiving them. But more significantly, they can do it through Bitcoin or mm -hmm. Dogecoin, or you name it, some whatever little system they have that they want to favor, they can do it. And one of the questions that has been raised that I think is quite interesting in this respect is where does Putin have all the money that he stole? Mm -hmm. Where does he keep it? If you Google Putin's wealth, you'll get articles that will say he has stolen anywhere between 70 billion and 200 billion. He may well even be the richest man in the world. Mm -hmm. Richer than Bezos or Elon Musk, because he's been looting an entire economy for, it's the 12th largest economy in the world. So you could come away with a lot of wealth mm -hmm. from that. How he does it exactly, we don't quite know. Could be that he just calls up and says, to the oligarchs, you've got this money here and you, you own the aluminum factory or whatever it is. And if you don't make me a shareholder, I'm going to see to it that you're audited and everybody in your plan is going to get COVID, <laughs> you name whatever huh. themes that, of violence that he will utilize. But then what does he do? Does he put it under his mattress? We know he has a hundred million dollar yacht, which was steaming back to Kaliningrad. Hmm. Um, 
hundred million dollar yacht. That's that's a pretty impressive example of penny pinching on a salary of one hundred and forty thousand dollars a year. <laughs> how many years? How many centuries would you have to <laughs> save one hundred percent of your money in order to make that work? That's a lot of lifetimes. Um, a lot of lifetimes. May I ask you something here, actually? So, as first of all, the mega political game, which we can get into that more later. Your book lays out the four variables of mega politics. I think it's effectively equivalent to the law of the jungle in some way. Um, and to your point, like with Putin, potentially the richest man in the world, and he's derived all of that wealth from coercion. Right? It's not like he's adding value really to the world. He's just skimming off of an existing economy. I'm, I'm curious here because the concept or, or the possibility of Russia being censored from the SWIFT network. How could Putin not have seen that coming as a response? Because the other, other piece here was I think Russia has over $600 billion in foreign reserves that are at risk to yeah, 650. How could he have not seen that coming? If he's going to invade Ukraine, wouldn't that be the first? I mean, if I'm gaming out the situation, that's the first thing I would think of. I don't, it just doesn't seem plausible that he would have neglected to um, make a contingency plan for that. Well, there are a couple of thoughts that I could throw off the top of my head. One of them is that he has been quite isolated in the Kremlin, that he doesn't show up to his office, hmm. and he's been isolated so he may not be getting the benefit of the advice that the institutional support that would have hmm. told him well, he's gaming these things well look you don't want to do this you want to be sure your yacht is not in a harbor in denmark because they're going to take it hmm. so he figured that out somebody gave him that suggestion but there are a lot of things that just don't spring to mind when you're working in a uh, perverse way like he is. You don't know there are unintended consequences. And I would say that perhaps we didn't even think of all the consequences because I mean, I sort of think that maybe the effect of throwing Russia out of the uh, SWIFT system is going to be to create a liquidity crisis in the world. It will make it harder for the, the banks that have lent a lot of money to Russia to be repaid. Mm -hmm. And probably Putin will be holding on to the money rather than paying his debts. So that's going to tighten liquidity. And it may be that it would be less appealing to the Federal Reserve if they see that the liquidity is under assault to um, go all the way and, and tighten liquidity here in the way that they were pretending they were going to do. Hmm. Interesting. It's just a thought. But it could turn out that way. You'd get a world starving for liquidity. Another consequence of having let the uh, cat out of the bag in terms of the SWIFT system. Mixed metaphor, but you get the point. Yeah. We've done. We don't know where we're going with all of this. We don't know what the consequences are going to be, but I think people in Biden's administration and the, the Boris Johnson's government, the French, Macron, the Italians, the Germans are all united thinking they don't want to have a hot war with Russia. Mm -hmm. So that sort of throws them back on the, uh, economic sanctions mm -hmm. and Russia does have a an international economy 
though it has been somewhat constrained ever since the 2014 seizure of Crimea. Mm -hmm. But they're not going to stop doing what they're doing because immediately, at least, because of economic sanctions, but they take the uh, some of the zest out of stealing a country. Yes, and I, I mean, as we were saying offline earlier, I think one of the likely possibilities of this, at least directionally, is that the more censorship we see, whether it's truckers having their contributions seized in Canada, or it's the censorship of Russia off of the SWIFT network, that is likely to stimulate more demand internationally, globally, for censorship-resistant money like Bitcoin. Um, yes. And, th you know, again, this is, a, especially in the Bitcoin community, this is probably the number one prediction of your book that came to pass that really uh, cements its prescience. And this idea of effectively what you called the ultimate offshore bank, right? I think you said when the ultimate offshore bank is open for business, or I would you said when the greatest tax haven of them all is fully open for business, all funds will essentially be offshore funds at the discretion of their owner. And that's pretty much describing Bitcoin, right? It's the, the Swiss bank account in your pocket, in your brain, um, within your circle of trust, however you choose to custody that. So maybe we could just unpack that a bit. How, what was the line of thinking that led you guys to predict something like Bitcoin? Again, I assumed you're writing this in like 95, 96, published in 97. So we're talking about, you know, 13 to 15 years before Bitcoin even existed. How did you guys predict this? Well, it seemed to me that the ingredients were right out there in public view. That you, you knew that you could have a, a high form of encryption. So I just put two and two together and got four. <laughs> I thought it was a, a one of my easiest predictions in the sense that Maybe I should have started Bitcoin instead of just predicting it. <laughs> but I thought the same thing about a number of uh, my predictions. I predicted that the Soviet Union would collapse. And uh, I should have gone to Ladbrokes in London and said, how much, what odds will you give me on a million dollar bet that the Soviet Union will not exist in five years. I could have probably made, <laughs> I would have, could, could have made a huge fortune on that, but I did something else. I went to, to I bought a property in St. Petersburg on the Nevesky Prospect near the Winter Palace because the Soviets had allowed private investment in real estate at that point. And it's probably because the oligarchs wanted to be able to cash out mm -hmm. and the more bids they could get, the better. So I did invest in a property in the Nevesky Prospect. And in the beginning, we seemed to be doing very well. But then Putin got involved and forced us to sell. Hmm. He, he said, well, you could keep some of it. He was the assistant to the uh, mayor of St. Petersburg at that time. And he was in charge of foreign investment. Hmm. <laughs> so he made us sell, which we did. And he let us keep our some of our profit. But it wasn't a huge win. It was a great idea, a great insight that had a piddling return because I didn't spend as much time as I should have thinking about how to profit from it. Hmm. Anyway, 
that's that's one of the hazards of thinking ahead. You don't do all your thinking in one. <laughs> I have a, uh, done pretty well in a lot of the things I thought about, but that was not one that lent itself to an easy financial reward because the whole thing about the Soviet Union was that they didn't want people to uh, make a lot of money. You could make money, but it wasn't uh, it wasn't on the up and up. Hmm. That's why some of the oligarchs were able to steal the uh, economy when it came to an end. The ones who were active in the underground realm were the ones who were best positioned to uh, make money out of it. Hmm. And yeah, if I may read, so this is something, I guess this would be a second order consequence of the emergence of Bitcoin, or again, what you guys called cyber cash. And that is that you wrote that taxing authorities have grown accustomed to treating their taxpayers as a farmer treats his cows, keeping them in a field to be milked. In the digital age, or the information age, I think is what you guys call it, that these cows would grow wings. So it was, I guess, tax revenue itself or the ability to centrally um, derive, manage and derive tax revenues from a large economy is what led to the growth of the nation state as the dominant modern institution. And then through the emergence of something like anonymous digital cash, you predicted that essentially nation states going into the 21st century with all their pretensions would be starved of this tax revenue and would begin to shrink necessarily right? as revenues decline, clearly your business model uh, and size decline. Um, this, seems, I mean, it's still shocking. It's still a lot to get your head around. When you say this to people today, they, they're very resistant to the idea, let's say. I think nationalism is very deeply embedded in most people's identity. So could you just describe to me that thought process of, you said you put two and two together to see digital cash, and then I guess you start thinking through the consequences of that. The first one is, oh, wow, the largest you know business in the world that derives its revenue via taxation is going to be forcibly shrunk. That must have been a startling re revelation for you. Well, it was a sort of startling re revelation, but it was, let me say, I had a friend, an old friend who was a family friend, and a guy who was at the end of his life, but a very brilliant man who had been a Rhodes Scholar. His name was Felix Morley, and he was one of three brothers who were all Rhodes Scholars. Felix's first job when he got out of college, out of the university after his PhD, was editor of the Washington Post. Hmm. You know, he was a man of the establishment. Then he became president of Haverford College. And we used to meet for drinks, tea, every few months and talk about the way the world was tending. And he was such a smart man, it was a treat to talk to him, at least it was for me. And uh, he had the, be the view that um, communism was never going to fade away because it was whenever they took over a country, they kept it and they kept getting bigger and bigger. And I kept thinking, thinking to myself, this is an illusion when the whole picture is seen, we'll find that communism doesn't work. It's not gonna take over, it's gonna fall apart. And it did fall apart in a very profound way in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union. And in China, it went away too, but in a different fashion. Because Deng Xiaoping basically put the kibosh on Stalinism 
not in the sense that he wouldn't shoot people in Tiananmen Square, but he was not going to make everything in the control of some big holding company. He wanted to give the Chinese mercantile its, its tradition and expression in China. And it has been extraordinarily successful, I have to say. So when we talked about, we saw a new digital form of money to consist of encrypted sequences, unique, anonymous, and verifiable, right out of the book, tradable in a keystroke in a multi-trillion dollar wholesale market without borders, Bitcoin, a decade before it came to be. I think that was a damn good call, <laughs> but I'm puffing myself up. I don't mean to do that. Well, I, I think you've earned it because it's spot on. Yeah, but we had fun with it. There are a lot of things in the book that were not right, but some of the things were. And we also talked about the growth of protectionism, which I thought was going to come as a result of the backlash against globalization. Mm. Yeah, you point out. I'm sorry, go ahead. And also the dangers of having megalomaniacs competing for power in demagogic elections with lies and fake news. That's another one of our mm -hmm. projections. Yeah, that one um, has been on quite the rampage recently. Uh, yes, it had got away. <laughs> yeah, and you, yeah. you guys also highlighted, you know, that basically this monopoly on currency that governments have become accustomed to enjoying, right? Where, you know, it's the only business in the world where you can go out and make a bunch of bad decisions, incur a bunch of debts, and then due to the monopoly on currency, you can just print your way out of it, basically. You just print money to pay all your bills and paper over your bad decisions, et cetera, et cetera. But as you, I would say, accurately predicted, now we're still, this is still playing out, clearly Bitcoin's still early days, but the, that option, that revenue option for governments to just inflate the currency supply is being foreclosed by the emergence of something like Bitcoin. So do you see national currencies just going the way of the dinosaur in the decades ahead? Or how do you see the coexistence, if any, of Bitcoin and, and fiat currency in the decades ahead? Well, I'm sure there will be a long period of coexistence. If you look back at the, uh, the end of the, the domination of the church in Europe, where it was a Susantry. There was a susantry of the Pope and other religious figures over a bunch of ruffians who were, you know, basically hell's angels on horseback mm -hmm. who ran the societies of Europe from the fall of the Roman Empire through the emergence of the gunpowder cultures. This was not the ideal political governance of the civics books. It was a bunch of thugs on horseback, very similar to what you'd find in a town of Hell's Angels came in and took over. Uh -huh. you know, they were, you'd have to be able to stand up to the Hell's Angels to make an argument that would be persuasive. Uh -huh. And not many people are prepared by the virtue of their own fears or physical attributes to take on Hell's Angels. They're all rubbing up their engines and they've got their chains in hand. And, mm -hmm. You know, they can beat the crap out of you in a heartbeat, kill you mm -hmm. and get away with it probably. So that's, but it didn't, 
when it all came to an end, when it started coming to an end, it wasn't a, a uniform change. It's, if you look at the little Republic of San Marino, which became an independent republic in the last days of the rest of the Roman Western Empire, survived through the Byzantine suzzantry over Italy. We call them Byzantines today, but they thought they were Romans. Hmm. He said to Emperor Boris II, oh, you're probably the smartest Byzantine emperor since Constantine. He would say, what? <laughs> he thought he was the Roman emperor. He didn't think he was the Byzantine. He never heard of that. Hmm. But um, they did survive, and there were strange hard to predict anomalies that were at work. And I'm not sure exactly how they're all going to play out. I haven't thought it through carefully enough to even pretend to make a guess. But I think that we're going to see less and less fiat money, more and more cryptocurrency, and technology will be incorporated in ways that provide benefits to societies. Economies are better off when they are solvent. Mm. And it isn't an illusion or just a fantasy that sound money is good for economic prosperity. So I think we'll get a lot of that, a lot of sound money. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and beneath the, you, you made this, you referenced a great quote from Marshall McLuhan in your book. I'll read. He said that today, after more than a century of electric technology, we've extended our central nervous system itself into a global embrace, abolishing both space and time as far as our planet is concerned. Um, it's very interesting, you know, it's, it's, we've, it's almost like the awakening of the global mind or something like that, where instead of these small, you know, or these divisive factions that we call nation states or whatever, that I guess is a result of cyberspace, people just have uh, access to this environment to conduct business and communicate free of coercion. Maybe not completely free, but much more free of coercion. And so a consequence of that, as you guys wrote, was that efficiency would become more important than the dictates of power in the organization of social institutions. And so that seems to be the big theme here is that it's, you know, again, if we just parse the word fiat itself, not just fiat currency, but fiat meaning do this because an authority said so rather than because you want to, that the digital age diminishes that, right? Because you can't, it's harder to force people. If like I have a lot of my wealth in Bitcoin and a multi-signature custody arrangement, you can't really coerce me financially, right? You can't turn off my money. You can't censor it. You can't prevent it from crossing borders. So that gives me as an individual a lot more negotiating leverage in the world, frankly. So is that the big theme that we're by moving our affairs into cyberspace or digital space it's just an environment that's more resistant to coercion so therefore the state which is based on coercion just becomes less relevant overall yes that's a good way of putting it when the logic of violence is changes, it changes the outcomes. And I think in this case, it's pretty clear that if you have any control over your own money, you would rather have it in an environment where you can deploy it free of predation. Mm -hmm. You don't necessarily want to give every little petty authority you encounter the ability to hold you up. Mm. 
I used to be a consultant to a, an offshore billionaire some years ago. And he was somebody who had gotten into big trouble with the former Soviet Union, but he was also a very, very clever entrepreneur. And he happened to go to Nigeria at one point for a meeting with one of the top dogs there about some oil concessions. And he was stopped at the border by a customs inspector who demanded a, a lot of cash as a fee for him to enter the country. And he'd come all, he'd come there to meet the president for pity's sake, but that didn't matter <laughs> because the customs guy wanted his payoff. And I remember being so impressed that it was that brazen that a customs official would hold up a billionaire at the door, at the door of the president's office and say, I'll let you in, but you've got to come back out in the next 10 minutes and give me $5,000. I mean, what, what a world we live in. That doesn't seem like it's a very positive way of doing things. And I was rather of the view that it was not going to last, stand the test of time. Hmm. So if you could have, if he could have come in and found another way into the president's office without having to pay off some petty bugging bureaucrat, he would have been delighted to do it. Because nobody is doing that because they think it's fun. Mm -hmm. It's not like visiting a prostitute or gambling or mm -hmm. drinking all night or something, but people will do it because they like it. There's, there's not very much like in that system. Mm -hmm. So it's bound to be vulnerable to falling away when the system changes. And I think it's changing now. It has all kinds of ramifications. It means that more and more will be determined by entrepreneurial discovery and less by credentials. Mm. You need, you know, it's, it's, it's quite interesting. In the first two months here in the last two months, last month, I believe was black history month. And, um, this month is women's history month hmm. and the woke people in the world have had a field day for the last month and coming into this month. I don't think it will make a difference if you're black, or if you're a woman, if you're a black woman. I mean, yes, in politics, it may make a difference to be the first black woman appointed to the Supreme Court. Maybe that is a good thing, but I don't think it matters in the world of efficiency and productivity. Whoever is good at something will be the one who gets the chance to make it work. It's not to say whoever succeeds is the only one who could have made it work. But right. There are certain things that happen that you think, well, this guy really saw the, uh, the light. I have a good friend named Peter Thiel who started PayPal and was the first investor in uh, Facebook. Uh -huh. And he told me that he was inspired by things I wrote to invest in Facebook. And I walked away from that conversation thinking I was underpaid. Yes, definitely. <laughs> but scratching my head in a way because there have been times when I could have invested $500,000 in a deal. But if I'd had $500,000 and I'd had the opportunity to invest in Facebook, I never would have done it. <laughs> never. Because I didn't see the point of automating the Harvard yearbook. Uh. You know, that's what it was in a sense. But that's not what it was. And Peter saw the other alternative meaning of it, which I didn't see, couldn't have seen. 
because it just didn't interest me. Mm -hmm. So good for him. And that's another thing that's quite interesting because it shows that in a world where technology is changing things, it sometimes makes a difference if you have a, uh, a group of different minds working on problems. Because some people will see things that other people won't see just because, not because the people who don't see it are stupid or they're not thinking about it, but they just don't have the experience, the basis of comparing things, the intuitions that may be almost impossible to specify why Peter Thiel decided to invest in Facebook, but 10.4% mm -hmm. of Facebook at the peak was worth $77 billion. It's got to be one of the greatest investments in history. Right? And he put and, half a million in, right? Something like that. Yeah, wow. So that's it's out of this world insane return. Indeed. Maybe King Solomon got a better return when he took over some neighborhood of Judea, but <laughs> but in the in the same sense that Putin did. And Putin's returns are not under the microscope in the same way that Peter's are, because we don't know how much he paid to get the. Uh, wherever he stole the 200 billion. Mm, right. Or perhaps it was only 70 billion. I don't know. Great return nonetheless. Uh, this sort of leads me to one of my favorite excerpts from your book, which I'll read. You wrote that, quote, market forces, not political majorities, will compel societies to reconfigure themselves in ways that public opinion will neither comprehend nor welcome. As they do, the naive view that history is what people wish it to be will prove wildly misleading." Unquote. I mean, I love this because there seems to be this delusion in modern democratic society that we can all just look at an issue, vote, pass some law, put some official in office, pass some laws, and then change reality to suit it, to suit our needs or wants or satisfy whatever that is. But that's just not the case when you look at human history, right? It's much more like the concentric spheres you described, where there's the mega political reality, the political reality, and then the economic reality. And what we're talking about with the emergence of encryption technology is one of those mega political variables that it's a yes. defensive technology, a very cheap and effective defensive technology, which lowers the returns to violence and coercion. And this is important because, as you also wrote in your book, it's precisely because violence pays that makes it hard to control. So how, where do you see the role, like how do you see the scope of violence changing into the future? I mean, if the nation state is disrupted, if the revenues do decline, does this mean we move back to a more decentralized, monarchical society where maybe people have their own localized protection services? Um, what is the future of violence through the scope of the sovereign individual? Well, I think this is uh, there's always going to be violence, there will be improvised violence that have come to people just as they come strolling around the corner, there'll be some goofball there with a 45. Mm -hmm. And I, I remember I was walking on the streets of Baltimore when some jackass came up to me with a 45 and put it in my nose and said, give me your wallet or I'll blow your head off. And I made a quick decision to give him my wallet mm -hmm. because I thought of, for a moment of reasoning with him, but I thought he doesn't care whether I have to go back to the Department of Motor Vehicles and get my driver's license reissued and whether this is going to cost me a lot of time and waste 
information or I have a beautiful girl's number in my wallet that I'm not going to be able to access now because he's taken it and he's going to throw it away. He's not going to know what it is. But that's just part of what happens. There's this quantum of mischief in life that you have to put up with somehow. Get around, live through. And I'm glad I made that decision because he didn't seem like a very forthcoming and forgiving person. Mm -hmm. Usually our leaders at least pretend that they're doing us a favor when they rob us blind. Mm -hmm. And very seldom do they get overtly indignant about it if they don't get the money that they hope to extract from citizens or people. So this came out with several senators when a couple of the Facebook billionaires renounced their U.S. citizenship and moved off to different places in the world. This was considered a an evil, evil thing to do. Hmm. And I'm sure there have been many convicted murderers who were seen in better lights than billionaires killing offshore. But it is what it is. I'm optimistic that life will be good, but we have several things that happened that I thought were somewhat different to what I expected. I uh, thought that I didn't really see how much the movement to online activity was going to present a kind of nuisance in life that reminds me of the Tylenol poisonings that happened in Chicago, if you remember, 30 years ago or more. I don't actually know about that. Well, several people, I think six people were poisoned with cyanide in Tylenol capsules. And some jackass wrote to the company, the Tylenol producers, which was a subsidiary of Johnson & Johnson, and basically said, pay us a million dollars and we'll stop poisoning people with your capsules. And the result was a complete change in the and transformation in the nature of packaging. Mm -hmm. So instead of having a lid that you could screw off easily and just reach in and grab a Tylenol capsule, you have plastic seals on the lids that you can scarcely scrape off. You can't chew them off. You can't wish mm -hmm. them off. You have to cut them off somehow. And then they have a seal on the inside, so it's tamper evident, not tamper proof. And this has happened throughout packaging. It's become a multi-billion dollar industry as a result of the, this mischief and mass murder that occurred in Chicago. One guy was sentenced to jail for extortion, but they don't think he could possibly have been the murderer himself. But he was just a, a sort of a uh, an opportunistic grifter <laughs> who used the thing to, to try to do his best to stop the uh, to make make money out of the opportunity and online transfers and online purchases create a kind of 
advantage or an opportunity for people to steal from other people. You mm -hmm. can get somebody else's hack in and grab somebody's identity and figure out what their password and their pin codes are. You can buy a car online and have it delivered by a truck to your house without even going out to test drive. Mm. So we have a lot of that overlay. Another thing that I failed to understand or I didn't really think about actually, but I clearly understand it is the role that the de development of the internet has played in promoting pornography. Mm. So now you have privacy, you have narrow casting, you can get the type of pornography that interests you, whatever floats your boat, you know, you see it online. And there's bound to be a lot of that. I didn't think about it so much, but once you see it in the rearview mirror, it's so obvious why it's happening. And right. it, that's what it is. In, um, so in a hypothetical world where Bitcoin is the dominant money, at least the situation where you're mugged for your wallet, that mostly goes away in that world because there just there's no incentive for the mugger, right? They can't if everything's in Bitcoin. Well, presuming it's custody it properly, the wallet thief wouldn't get away with anything. Yes, so it, you have to. It depends on what the expectations of your thief are. I've known people who carry fake wallets mm. to, with $100 in them or something. So if somebody comes to mug them, they give them the fake wallet. Hmm. And they, the mugger is happy, he gets $100. And you're happy because you haven't lost your life and nothing of great value is gone. So that's one option. I don't know, but I think in general, you're right that when people stop carrying a lot of money on their or cash on their person, there will be more uh, protection against being mugged. Mm -hmm. Be mugged because there'll be no reason to mug you. You know, I suppose in a nudist camp, there's very little mugging. <laughs> right? <laughs> Right. <laughs> we all know there's nothing there to take. Yeah, that's, um, I'm reminded here of a, I can't remember who, which celebrity it was, but they were saying they showed up to a red carpet event and they just jumped out of the car, whatever car they were in because they were late and they left the keys in the car because there were all these paparazzi around. Or there's all these people taking pictures and videos and so they just assumed that there, you know, no one would steal the car because it was in plain sight of all these onlookers. Um, and I guess the lesson there is that a lot of transparency reduces criminality to some extent. Hey everybody, as you've no doubt learned by watching this show, Bitcoin is the single most important asset you can own in the 21st century. And one of the most important companies in Bitcoin today is Nidig. Nidig's mission is to get Bitcoin into the hands of as many people as possible. One of the ways they are accomplishing this mission is by empowering banks and financial technology companies to offer their own Bitcoin products and services. As a true game changer in the industry, Nidig is safely unlocking the power of Bitcoin for forward-thinking individuals and institutions alike. Led by Robbie Gutman, Yin Zhao, and Ross Stevens, Nidig has absolutely exploded onto the Bitcoin scene recently and has quickly become a leader in this space. So, whether you are a professional investor looking for asset management services or a company looking to white-label your own Bitcoin product or service, Consider Nidig your single source solution for everything Bitcoin. So we've touched on the mega political domain. Um, I guess now would be a good time to mention those variables that your book talks about. And you lay out four mega political variables, which are topography, climate, 
microbes and technology. Um, and I guess it seems to me like technology is becoming increasingly more of a dominant mega political variable relative to the others, given that it, as we said earlier, it frees you from locality to a large extent. Could you just walk me through, unpack the, like these four mega political variables? How did you establish these um, in the current world today? Is tech, am I right say, saying that technology is becoming more of a dominant relative to the other three? And then um, as a result well, of this shifting environment, where do you see these mega political variables taking us into the future? Well, I think it, a lot depends on how robust the micro the microbes are the pathogens that explode out of some Chinese market where people would go to eat bats or whatever mm -hmm. it is they were doing um, not to my taste I can sure assure you of that but the fact that we do have this plague that we've seen in the world is a reminder that it's not all technology, but technology plays a, an ever bigger role. And we hope it continues to be predominant because if you look at the, the role that mountains play in the projection and defense against power, Presumably, that is a stable factor, unless mountains are going to be falling and erupting in the middle of flat plains. Mm -hmm. We hope that won't happen. We hope that there's not going to be a shower of asteroids coming in from outer space that are blowing the smithereens out of the world, because we know from the past that these asteroid landings have caused the equivalent damage to a nuclear war. Mm -hmm. we, we've been told over and over, I guess, that the, the dinosaurs died because of the, uh, the, the carry-on effects of a big impact that not only created a, uh, a big hole someplace, maybe a hole in the ocean, mm -hmm. but they also created a globally encompassing explosion that occurred because they heated things up so much that right. it just things on the other side of the world caught fire. Even so yeah. And then a nuclear winter following that, right? Yes. Yeah. So it wouldn't, you, you don't need to move to the south to the South Pole to avoid being hit by the um, incoming asteroid. Because even if you're on the South Pole, you're still going to be screwed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's no place, no place to hide. I hope that that is not a big factor, because if it is, it means that we're never going to be able to spend our Bitcoin the way we hoped. <laughs> right. Yeah. But um, I think technology has the greatest reach of all these things, apart from potentially microbes that could cause some horrible plague that there wouldn't be an easy or ready antidote to, mm -hmm. I think pretty much. I'm not quite sure whether the COVID uh, vaccinations are all that they've been made out to be. I mean, it looks more and more like they're going to be almost like penicillin mm. that you need to take them not every day, but occasionally, at least periodically to refurbish your immune response. And there was recently a uh, report from a German 
um, health insurer that the number of adverse reactions to the COVID vaccinations was many times higher than the reported official figures. And the uh, insurance company projected that if their figures were indicative of what was going on throughout the German economy, that something like two and a half to three million people were hospitalized for side effects of the COVID vaccinations. So that's something we didn't hear. Joe Rogan may have said something like that, but that put him in the ninth circle of hell, according to the <laughs> theologians, Joni Mitchell and Neil Young. So who knows? Yeah, I had um, Dr. Robert Malone on the show, who was on the Joe Rogan podcast. And yeah, for just even asking questions about the efficacy or the data, you know, people were being canceled or, you know, vilified, attacked, all of these things. Um, it does seem interesting to me, though, that, again, we're sitting here early March 2022. As soon as the Russia-Ukraine conflict heated up, it's like the mainstream media did a hard pivot, just stopped talking about COVID completely and started talking all about the war. Um, and we've seen restrictions dropped in a lot of places since then as well. Is there some overarching agenda coming through mainstream media that I, I, don't, I presume it would be supporting, you know, state policy to some extent, but it's hard to untangle. Well, I, I don't think it's a, I don't think there's this conspiracy central where they send out a morning <laughs> right. bulletin that tells you what you can think and what you should say today. But people have a way of knowing where their bread is buttered, mm -hmm. or put it another way, as uh, was well said, I believe by Sinclair Lewis, that it's very difficult to convince a man of something if his livelihood depends on him not understanding. All right. Incentive blindness. Yes. There's sort of self orchestrated agreement. That, and I found this quite interesting. I thought about it a lot when I was preposterous enough to forecast the collapse of the Soviet Union. At that point, I would have thought that that was a positive forecast in the fact in that the United States was engaged as a major opponent of the Soviet Union in a Cold War, which was costing a lot of money and which brought the world several times to the precipice of nuclear annihilation. Mm -hmm. So saying that the Soviet Union would collapse, you would think would have been good news. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't. I remember being awakened by a friend of mine one day, and he said, you better get up and turn on the television because they're making fun of you on the Today Show. And they were making fun of me. I was supposed to be a, a horrible person because I forecast that the Soviet Union was going to collapse. I was threatening this consensus of whatever it was. And so I was some sort of idiot. And Newsweek wrote a, an article about my forecast that said it was an unthinking attack on reason. Huh. An unthinking attack on reason. I thought, well, that's crazy because you can't have an unthinking attack on an abstraction. <laughs> <laughs> you, have, you have to think about it. It's not like you can go out and kick it. Yeah, or something. Yeah, yeah. You have to think about it. And I thought, well, that's crazy. I don't know why they're saying that. But strangely enough, the guy who wrote that article actually wrote me an apology hmm. in 1992 after the Soviet Union collapsed. Mm -hmm. I was totally a moron for saying this. And I was with 
Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton and four U.S. senators, I think, if I recall rightly, on New Year's Eve of 1998, when we were at, everybody was asked to say what was the big event of the coming year. And I said, the Berlin Wall is going to fall. Hmm. This was like, I might have, well, pissed in the punch bowl. I don't know why they were offended by it, but they were. It, it comes back, I think, to the same thing we were talking about, that it's not that there is a script that you have to read off of the things you have to believe today and the things you no longer believe because the news cycle has changed. But there is a kind of consensus about the business to hand. Mm -hmm. Interesting. What so will the the collapse of the USSR? As you said, nobody saw it coming except yourself. Um, this was effectively induced by the economics of the situation, right? They were more or less bankrupted by the West, as I understand it. And then they, when the USSR fell, it fractured into I don't, what twenty or thirty states, I believe. Do you see the coming dissolution of the nation state following a similar pattern where states are just being starved of revenue, starved financially, so they will start to fracture and split apart? I think they will split, fracture and split apart. And I think there's, it's quite telling that smaller polities are actually performing much more effectively and much better than the big ones. If you know about the blue state, red state, or you follow that argument, which is sort of everywhere, so it's hard not to follow it. Um, there is talk, really quasi serious talk about the possibility of civil war because the red state wants to do something, the blue state wants to do something else. And it shows how difficult it is to compose a policy that one size fits all mm -hmm. in a world where we have narrow casting information or, you know, we can see that if you look at the, which countries have the greatest life expectancy, Monaco. Hmm. All the, the little tiny countries, the smaller they are, the larger their life expectancy. Hmm. And you want to look at places that are rich, Monaco, people, the average per capita wealth there is way, way above what it is in an industrial society because for one thing, rich people can go there and not be taxed as long as they're not French citizens, yeah. and they do. And of course, a few people get run over in the streets when they have their annual race, but not many. So the average combined life expectancy of men and women is about 90 years of age. Huh. That is pretty good. And I think that when things really start to splinter, we're going to see a devolution to a smaller size of government because these smaller sized entities will be more prosperous, will be easier for them to achieve community comedy because they're not all going to beat each other because we want to do this or you want to do that. Mm -hmm. You know, you could have a situation where abortion is legal in some states and not in others. Mm -hmm. Why would that be a crisis? I mean, it would be less convenient for people who wanted an abortion in a, a non-abortion state. But you look at the way we treat Indian tribes in the United States or in Canada, 
the native bands, as they call them there, that have a certain kind of quasi sovereignty. Mm-hmm. You know, that you can, they can create their own gambling mm-hmm. laws and presumably they can do other things too. I'm not quite sure all of the range of their sovereignties, but they do things that you and I can't do. So you've got this peculiar contrast or dissonance between the claim that we all are equal, but if you're one eighth Indian blood or something, you're more equal because you can get payments on account of that. You can start your own missile testing system on the reservation. I don't know what you could do, but there are quite a few things you can do. Uh Maybe you can broadcast a a pirate radio station. Uh You know, you can certainly do the roulette wheels and the lotteries, all of that stuff. So maybe through Indian tribes, we'll see more sovereignty emerging, Mm. but it's going to devolve back to a smaller, more local level. I'm not sure exactly the particular route by which it will take that, but it's going to go to a lower level and more things will happen And small little things will split off and become their own little countries. I mean, you could have little city states again. Mm-hmm. You had a lot of city states in Italy after the fall of Rome. And you had the, the Pope running countries, basically little countries. And it was whole rather, it became quite messy. If you read Dante's Inferno, which is an interesting epic poem, Dante had a scheme of hell, which was a bunch of concentric circles Uh where various sins were punished, some of them in a very grim way. And he used the examples of people, his contemporaries, to illustrate the sins and what he thought was going to happen to them. One sinner that he he singled out for special uh, criticism was Pope Boniface VIII, who was he thought a man of great treachery because he had besieged an Italian city, which was the residence of a uh, noble family who thought that the Pope had cheated on his election and they wanted him to be deposed as Pope. And he issued a false amnesty to these people and told them that they, if they surrendered, they would be treated mercifully and there would be no consequence. But when they did surrender, he actually killed 6,000 people from that town and burned down Julius Caesar's home that was there. So he was not a very nice guy. He was a total lying SOB. So he's immortalized now in Dante's Inferno Hmm. as this treacherous loser. Hmm. Anyway, we have the example of these city states that were proliferating around Italy in the middle of the Middle Ages. By the time that gunpowder really became established, it was obvious that you needed to have money 
to build enough cannon to <clears throat> blow down the walls. And you needed to have money to build up walls in a particular way that would be more resistant to bombardment. Mm -hmm. So money raised the scale and now the scale is falling, but it's not clear exactly how it falls because it never really is that clear. It's mm -hmm. an improvisation around a new frontier, basically the different frontier of, of action when it becomes more profitable to be a uh, small entity mm -hmm. will get more small entities. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't change all at once. The example of Charlemagne and the Holy Roman Empire that came along hundreds of years after the Western Roman Empire ceased to exist. Maybe we'll still have the United States of America in 400 years, but it won't be the same country operating on the same principles. At least I doubt it will be. Yeah, I agree. Um, I think there was a point made earlier in your book that society comes to reflect the technological realities on which it's built. So we're moving from this, you know, large scale industrial society with a large scale industrial nation state containing it as the container for it to what would appear to be um, a much smaller scale governance apparatus of some kind to reflect this smaller scale of, of microprocessing. Um, and all of this feeds into government scale, right? As, as you describe in the book that, you know, the economics of offense and defense are actually shaping the scale of government. And you wrote that when, when offensive capabilities are rising, the ability to project power at a distance predominates. And this causes jurisdictions to tend to consolidate and governments to form on a larger scale. So if there's higher returns to violence, we get bigger government. And then, um, Alternatively, when defensive capabilities are rising, it becomes more costly to project power outside of core areas, causing jurisdictions to devolve and big governments to fracture into smaller ones. So when the cost of defense decreases, the profitability to coercion and violence falls, and we tend to get smaller government apparatus. Um, so damn fascinating i mean i really have to thank you again for opening the door to all of this um there's this way of looking at the world that i think is not common to a lot of people um we're coming close to our time i guess i would just perhaps like to ask you for a general view of where you think all this is headed i mean in bitcoin circles and this is something I've been very adamant about is I don't see how you stop Bitcoin per se. There just doesn't seem to be a viable attack vector on it. And it would lead me to believe as well that the more governments are inflicting taxation and inflation on their, their customers, right, on citizens, that they're just going to create more demand for inflation, coercion, resistant money like Bitcoin. So there does seem to be this toppling occurring, whereas Bitcoin monetizes the the integrity of the nation state model is just um, crumbling. Do you see it that way as well? I mean, I, I know that's the thesis of the book, but I'd love to just get your general views on where we at, where we are at and where we are going today. Well, I think it's often hard to see beyond today's news and the uh, the weather outside. If there's a big blustery storm, you go out and get your car and drive someplace, you do so with different parameters and different alertness to what's going around mm -hmm. than you do on a bright sunny day. And I think on the sunny day with the wind behind you, you can see that the pressures are building for 
an end to a system which is exhausting it or has exhausted its potential. And we have lots of institutions in our current world that don't pay their way. And ultimately, if things don't pay their way, they tend to go out of business. Mm -hmm. Even if you have governments that are doing their eager best to meet the requirements and requests of the public, they can't just make things happen out of a wand. You know, we've heard many times that Social Security is a a system in stress that's facing bankruptcy. We have similar problems with the health insurance programs. These things did pay their way once upon a time. Bismarck started the welfare state in the end of the 19th century as a way of bribing people to support the nation state. It was a well considered bribe and it worked for a century or more, but I don't know that it's going to work forever. I mean, I don't think it will because at some point something will come along that's a little more disorderly and a little less compliant than what we've seen. If you have a a billionaire who has a lot of technical savvy, you might be able to create a uh, system that would be able to fight the nation state quite effectively and demand certain things. I'm not sure what, but maybe it, some guy says, look, either you exempt us from taxation and regulations or we're going to hack into every, uh, electric power generator and close down the grid. Hmm. That would be a, a bad news. So the system I'm saying is the system is, it's not necessarily going to happen in a, an incremental way where everything is gradually changing and you can see by the week or the month, well, it's the nation state is only 70% of what it was this time last year. Mm -hmm. It may go along and seem to be this staying the same for many years and then poof, Hmm. things change and they're gone. What used to be the way of the world works is no longer the way it works. Mm. But, you know, when Romulus Augustus was the last emperor of the Western Roman Empire, he was pensioned off by the barbarians. They gave him a castle in Southern Italy and quite a bit of money. I mean, it was a pension that was equivalent to many millions in today's dollars. Gold, gold coins, Mm -hmm. big ones. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to get any real information about how long the pension was paid Mm -hmm. or did they pay it till the end of his life? Um, And who paid it? You know, that's another question. Mm. I guess these are all puzzles that are yet to be cleared cleared up in terms of our the change that we're going through now. But I'm pretty sure that at some point we'll find that 
the opportunities to live a comfortable retirement on a government pension will be less than we think they are. Mm-hmm. I had an interesting discussion recently with a young woman who was a Harvard graduate and was a public school teacher at one time. And she had an offer of marriage from a, another public school teacher who had been at it for a long while, teaching in the Bronx and had secured a vested pension, which had a certain amount of income, health insurance of a, of a fairly comprehensive kind. And she said, well, he wasn't a millionaire, but I could see with that pension that I would, I could be secure. Mm. So she was ready to marry this guy for his money, as a, for the pension. At some point, that will no longer happen. Mm. Even the millennial and the sub-millennial girls that are thinking about making their way in a world which is a little challenging for them, especially because a lot of the guys their age don't have any real money. Um, they will say, well, you have a pension? That's not good enough because that's not going to be paid. Right now, they assume the pensions are going to be paid, but they may, they'll, they'll come a day when they'll say, well, that won't be any good. Mm-hmm. That's another one of the indicators. It was one of my, uh, fascinations when I used to live in the Washington area. I'm a big baseball fan and I would go to the minor league stadium where the Oriole and Nationals farm teams played. Mm -hmm. And what what was interesting is you could see the girls hoping to hook up and marry a guy who's going to be a Hall of Famer. Or major leaguer for thirty or twenty-five years or something, and make two two million a year. They would be the best judges of talent. They were talent scouts of the first order, because they found the ones who were going to work. And most of these guys who did go into the major leagues were already married by the time they get a double A ball, because the good-looking women were also good at what they did, which is assessing their (laughs) talent. And I think we'll know more, not that there's any sort of aggregate reporting of this, but when we hear from through the grapevine that the equivalent of the the Harvard educated young girl who's looking for security decides not to marry somebody for the New York City school pension mm. because she doesn't think it's going to amount to anything. Or maybe a federal pension. I'm not sure what, which is most indicative, but at some point it all runs out. Yeah, there's an incredible amount of unfunded liabilities at the government levels. I mean, also Social Security, Medicare, a lot of these things, um, they're not fully funded, basically. And they're not, my understanding that governments don't even report them as liabilities necessarily. They're sort of off the book liabilities. Well, it's because they have the right, as they see it, to change the terms. Right. (laughs) (laughs) It's like if I say, well, I'll pay you I'll pay your children's college tuition. I don't have to include that as a liability unless I have a legal obligation to do it. But if I'm just saying I'm going to do it, I change my mind. Well, I've changed my mind. It's a hollow promise. Yeah, exactly. Well, it's certainly um, quite the bewildering world we're going into. I mean, things just keep changing faster and you know, even things that we take for granted, like the existence of the nation state are now being called into question. Um, So, you know, 
just one more time, thank you for writing this book. You know, thank you for bringing these ideas to the forefront. And, um, you know, I also, through your book, got into a deeper study of the literature on the economics of violence, reading people. Um, I think Frederick Lane comes to mind, read some of his work. Uh, there's many, many people cited in your book. And it's just, uh, it's a fascinating rabbit hole. And I, I agree that what we've been taught in school as conventional wisdom, as the, the purpose and genesis of the state, it's just not at all true, right? It just, it, it excludes these mega political considerations, um, which is quite telling. So, yes, I, I think I, I amused myself maybe more than others when I said that there's so little understanding of mega political variables that you never see demonstrators saying, "Invent a weapon system that improves <laughs> the importance of the infantry." <laughs> you don't see that. Right. It's not going to happen. But that is what determines whether you have more democracy or less. Yeah. If the country are very important, yeah. you get more democracy. This has been true since ancient Greece. But underlying the ancient Greek um, importance of democracy was a topographical feature, which is the, the Greek literal with mm -hmm. all these little islands off the coast and right. the harbors and indentations put a lot of land close to the water. Mm -hmm. And the high value crops of the ancient world, which were wine and olives, was the olives for the olive oil and the wine for the the grapes for the wine could be shipped across the whole Mediterranean mm -hmm. for a bare fraction of what it would take to move it 10 miles inland. Right. And the fact that you had a lot of areas that were close to the water where you could conceivably pick them up and ship them meant that there were a lot of hoplites who were people who could arm themselves at their own expense from the profits they made from their farming activities and they became the basis of democracy because mm. you couldn't do without them. Mm -hmm. you couldn't go over them. The Persians tried to do it and they found it very difficult because they were motivated to keep their property. Mm -hmm. They wanted to defend it and they had the ability to do that. So that's the nature of, that's how it was then. But if you were sitting down to invent a technology that would make infantry more important today, you'd be hard pressed to know what to do or where you start. <laughs> yeah. it, I think these things tend to fluctuate outside of conscious control. Yeah, agreed. And I would, I would propose that Bitcoin is one of the most transformational technologies in history um, to the logic of violence because it's the first property right that's really independent of the monopoly on violence, right? It's just, it's, it's a bearer asset, but it's just information. So the possibilities that it opens up from a custody and transportation standpoint are virtually limitless. So it makes it really hard to coerce an individual that's storing their wealth in that medium, which means it could just totally crush the profitability of violence which is promising, but yeah, also very true. transformational to the world. Yes, and we're seeing now, as we think about this, a clear demonstration of how the old violence with new clothes is at work in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And we talked about it earlier, the BBC's report of it column of tanks 60 kilometers long. I mean, that is... It's a lot of tanks. <laughs> the male fist pounding you in, right in the nose. Yeah. But then again, you also have the Stinger missiles 
that blow these things to smithereens. Hmm. If there are enough of them in the Ukra- hands of Ukrainian people who are brazen enough to use them, it could drag on for some while. Hmm. I don't know exactly what Putin is going to do, but I would suspect at a certain point he may be pushed to concede some ceasefire or something because Hmm. he doesn't want to kill a hell of a lot of Russian. That was the end of the Afghanistan war when too many Russian soldiers came back in body bags. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how the Ukrainians can be that much better than at the fight than the Russians are. Maybe because they're fighting for them, they think they're fighting for themselves, hmm. and not to assert some kind of additional control. Hmm. Yeah, excellent points, um, James. Thank you again. Um, would you like to let my audience know where they can find out more about you or your work? Oh, sure. They could, if they're interested in my investment newsletter, they could go to www.strategicinvestment.com and we have a way to subscribe there. I, I can tell you right now, I so far this year I've had nine option trades on the S&P or stock indices. One of them is on another index. And eight of them have been closed out. Eight of them were profitable. With an average profit of more than $1,000 per trade. And I use that as an example because I think it's a pretty good one. And if you think of all the volatility that's been swirling around markets lately, to get those option trades right, all of them right, not that I can ever pretend that I'm always going to be right, but Mm -hmm. to get them all right is a pretty damn good record. (laughs) And we have had, I think when the uh, COVID deal came out, we warned people in advance long before it was clear that it was going to be what it is. It was clear to me that it was going to happen. And I talked about it and I think I got, if everybody, anybody who followed my specific recommendations and bought when I told them to and sold when I told them to would have been like $70,000 a head, hmm. which is, pretty good for a $75 subscription, (laughs) not, not shabby. So I think not that I can say that we're always right. And I warn everybody that you're not everything, everything entails risk, but I think we do find a lot of good opportunities for subscribers and they're going to be repaid many times over as compared to the cost of the subscription. And we've had some quite good Bitcoin trades as well. Hmm. Not only forecast Bitcoin, but I've played with it. And I think it's the fact that it's going up again now. Also, I have some Ethereum in the portfolio Hmm. for good reason, because It's not the only, Bitcoin is not the only thing that will make money. And there may be some new ones coming along that will make money. But I, I don't try to keep track of all the new <laughs> cryptocurrencies. But yeah, it, we do. you never know. <laughs> yeah. I, but I think Bitcoin is here to stay. Oh, yes. Agreed completely. And I, I personally just accumulate Bitcoin, but the, you know, the, all the other crypto assets are even more volatile than Bitcoin. So there's a lot of opportunities to make or lose money. Uh, right. But I think it's interesting that just yesterday, Bitcoin was up 10%, Ethereum up 8% and a couple of others up 7% on the 
realization that the expulsion of Russia from SWIFT was going to create a greater demand for cyber currencies. Yeah. And Bitcoin is right at the head of the class. Yeah. I'm not saying that there wasn't an invisibly small alternative currency someplace that didn't go up 30%, mm. but 30% from nothing to something. You know, it's, yeah. Yeah. And liquidity on a lot of those smaller crypto assets is a big problem. Um, I used to, used to operate a hedge fund in the space and it's just, you could be up, but getting out of the position, there could be a, a lot of slippage and all these things. So um, to the audience, do your own research because it's a very um, tricky market out there, but. Always. Thank you so much. Um, I look forward to talking again sometime. And sure. um, maybe I'll be seeing you at, I know you mentioned there's, would that be worthwhile to mention here? As you said that uh, there might be an event, I think, about the sovereign individual at some point. Well, I'm not sure it's going to be a public event, but Peter uh, Thiel had indicated that he would uh, stage a Symposium at Oxford mm. about the sovereign individual as a retrospect, talking about the ideas. And I'm looking forward to that because I think it'll be a lot of fun. Yeah, agreed. These these ideas need to be discussed more broadly, so that would be exciting. With well, that, James, I will let you go. Thank you so much. Thanks, Robert. It was my pleasure. Hey guys, I hope you found this episode valuable. At the What Is Money Show, we are striving to deliver the most valuable knowledge possible in each and every episode. However, as Aristotle said, the purpose of knowledge is action, not knowledge. So I hope you're deriving some useful knowledge from the show, and I hope it's improving the actions you are taking in your life. Speaking of action, if you want to dive deeper into the big ideas explored in this show, please sign up for my newsletter titled The Freedom Analex at breedlove22.substack.com. Also, have you bought your tickets for Bitcoin 2022 in Miami yet? If not, it's your lucky day as I am giving away 10 million sats, which is roughly 4,000 US dollars to one lucky person who buys a conference ticket through my affiliate link. My affiliate link can be found on my Twitter profile at breedlove22, um, which also has a link. My Twitter profile has a link to my link tree, which you can also visit my link tree directly for links to all my work, including Bitcoin 2022 affiliate cells. My link tree is l-i-n-k-t-r dot e-e backslash breedlove22. Thank you so much. I appreciate you guys watching the show. I hope you're finding some valuable knowledge in the What Is Money show, and I'll see you back here again next time.